All right, hello again, and then just want to introduce myself one more time. My name is Bob Lee. I'm one of the pastors here. If you have any questions about getting connected about our church, feel free to just, again, email me anytime, Lee at pathwaybible.org. We'd love to have a cup of coffee as well and catch up or if you have any questions about anything here at Pathway. I want to start off today by asking a question just to get you thinking. What is your biggest regret? To which you may say, which one? <laughs> right? I mean, we have so many. In fact, to be human is to fail and make mistakes and have regrets. And the longer we live this life, probably the more regrets we have. Just to get you thinking about some regrets in case you, know, you have too many or you can't think of one, here are some gen- general categories of regrets that people typically have. Maybe in the area of romance. Maybe one of your regrets is being in that relationship. Uh, Your mom, people closest to you said it was a toxic relationship, but you thought he or she would be different or whatever, and then you still have regrets. Or maybe conversely, you have regrets about a romantic relationship that you never pursued because you're too scared to ask that person out or get to know that person, and you have regrets to this day. Or maybe some of your regrets are about your family members that you wish you had reconciled sooner, not wasted so much time. Or you wish you had said something different or done something different, and maybe that person's not around anymore that you can't reconcile. And so, again, we have regrets. We all have regrets about family. Maybe some of you have regrets about education, that maybe you spent too much money and too long pursuing a degree that you're not using today, and you wish you had gone back. If you could do it all over, you'd pick a different major. Or maybe some of us wish we had pursued more education, got that graduate degree, advanced degree in something. Or maybe some of us, we have regrets about our career, uh, the career path that we're on, some of the career opportunities that we've sort of let go, or maybe we've thought it was God's will, we took it and we're in a place where we realize we hate what we're doing, (laughs) maybe. Uh, Maybe you have regrets about your career. Many of us have regrets about our finance, right? Should not have leased that, should not have bought that, should not have sold that, (laughs) should have started saving up for retirement sooner, whatever it is. I mean, we all have regrets, I think, about finances as well. And finally, We all have, if you're a parent, regrets about parenting. Uh, Especially if you have multiple children, you have regrets about your firstborn, typically. But to parent, again, is to have regrets because we're all sort of learning as we go along. So maybe this is an area that you have regret in. What is your biggest regret? But maybe a better question, in fact, not maybe, I think a better question than what is your biggest regret is, what did you learn from your biggest regret? I think that's a far greater question or better question. You see, for some of us, in these regrets, we can get stuck in time and we can't seem to move forward. You're always sort of second guessing, triple guessing, quadruple guessing yourself. You're sort of, again, wondering, could have, this, I could have, should have, would have, right? Looking back and wishing things were different. And sometimes we just get stuck there. But really, we can learn from this and we can grow through this. And so what, is, what did you learn from your biggest regret? And I hope you learned some good lessons and I hope you're not repeating them. So Henry Ford said this, the only real mistake, or I'd substitute failure here as well, is the one from which we learn nothing. The only real mistake or failure is the one from which we learn nothing. That every time we fail or make a mistake, it is an opportunity to learn and grow. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, even more so, that God is at work in us, that he works all things out for the good of those who love him, including our failures and our mistakes, if we allow him to. We're in a message series starting today called Fail Forward, learning how we can grow and how we can learn from our failures as we rely on God and his grace to help us move forward. Today, we're going to start at the very beginning, basically, how we've been freed from sin now to choose to follow God or not to follow him. So if you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, please turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 11 to 18. We'll also have the verses on the screen. So feel free to do what's most comfortable for you on your phone, paper Bible, screen, or do nothing. If you're new to church, you're coming back to church, it's been a long time since you've watched something like this or been in a place like this. We really, we we just want you to have a great experience. Come back again, get to know us and this Jesus whom we love and whom we follow. So just to give you a quick overview, which is hard to do with the book of Romans, it's probably one of the more difficult books to read along with Revelation, the book of Revelation. And uh, the time I have, I'm just going to do a quick overview. Uh, But Paul is writing this letter to the church at Rome, as well as probably the churches in that region. And scholars say the first five chapters of the book of Romans, so the next time you read it for yourself, it's basically, it's talking about justification. Now, that means really being made right with God. Someone has said this, that justification is like just as if you had not sinned. 
that you go to a court thinking, again, you had a debt that you owed that you couldn't pay, you're going to be convicted, and all of a sudden the, gu- uh, the judge says, you're not guilty, you are innocent. And that's really what's happened on our behalf by putting our faith in Jesus, that he's paid the penalty for us. He's been punished for us. So when you and I put our faith in him, it's just as if we had not sinned. So Paul talks the first five chapters about this in the first five chapters, our need to be justified before a holy God. And then in chapters six and eight, he talks about something called sanctification. Now again, it's it's a Christian word that you may not understand, but if you don't understand it, it means this. Sanctification It's a step-by-step process when the Holy Spirit works in our lives and conforms us into the image of Christ. That we're justified the moment we ask Jesus to come into our lives to forgive our sins and to be the Lord of our lives. And we're sanctified from that moment forward. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us and he changes us moment by moment, bit by bit, to become more like Jesus. That's why our mission statement here at Pathway is to lead you all into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Because as long as you have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his spirit in us will change us to look more and more like Jesus. So we're going to jump in here in verse 11. So I realize there's a lot before this. There's going to be a lot after this. Feel free to study it on your own. Go more in depth in your small group. But for today, I'm just going to give you sort of a quick overview of how we've been freed now to choose to sin or not to sin. That we have this freedom now. So Paul writes this. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Whenever you read in the same way or therefore, it's referring to what's been written previously. And so what's been written previously, there are several verses, but I'm just going to pick the the most immediate one right before it, verse 10, where Paul writes this. The death he died, and he's talking about Jesus here, the death Jesus died, he or Jesus died to sins once for all. But the life he, Jesus, lives, he lives to God. What he's referring to, again, is what we celebrated last weekend. On Good Friday, what we remembered is Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, that he died once for all, that he paid the penalty, the price that you and I could not pay. And because of that, when you and I put our faith in him, we are justified, declared not guilty, innocent. But he also lives. He didn't just die for our sins, but he rose again. And now he lives to God. There is a new life for those of us who put our faith in him. In Jesus. And that's why he says, in that same way, we're to count ourselves or consider yourselves dead to sin. Now, this is a a mental sort of attitude change. It's like, I know you're used to being like enslaved to sin, addictions, poor relationships, poor habits. I know that was your past, but he's saying now we can choose again to recognize that we've been set free. We can consider ourselves now dead to sin. Because Christ died on our behalf. And not only that, alive to God in Christ Jesus. At the moment, again, we ask Jesus to forgive our sins, his spirit came to live in us. We have this new identity. We have this new power. We have this new access to our heavenly father. And then he says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desire. So based on all that, he's saying, Don't let sin control you. Be in control. To which you and I, if you're paying attention, like, wait a second, didn't you say count yourselves dead to sin? If we're dead to sin, then how can sin still reign in us? Well, see, what Paul is making a point, he's said this earlier, that before, you and I didn't have the freedom to choose to sin or not to sin. We just kept sinning. We were enslaved to sin. And so we didn't have a choice. But now, Because God's spirit lives in us and we're forgiven and he empowers us, you and I can choose. We're free to choose now to sin or not to sin. And so he's saying when we still choose to live like we used to live and obey all those sort of sinful desires that we all wrestle with, then that's like letting sin control you again. So don't let sin control you. That word sin, by the way, I think is synonymous with failure because it means falling short of God's standard. And when sin is controlling you and reigning in your life, even as a follower of Jesus Christ, that's when we experience failures. Moral failures, ethical failures, just poor decisions. Think about this for a moment. If you've been walking with Jesus for a certain amount of time, think back. What is that biggest regret? And then ask yourself this question. Were you a Christian back then? Or maybe if you were a Christian, were you walking closely with Christ back then? I look back and some of my biggest regrets were before I met Christ, 
relationships, poor choices, attitudes, and brokenness. But even after I became a Christian, I have some regrets that as an immature young Christian, I still, again, let sin reign in my body. And when sin reigns, there is failure. And when there's failure, there is regrets. So Paul is saying, hey, let Jesus reign in you now. You have a choice now. Before you had no choice, now you have a choice. You've been freed to choose to allow now Jesus to take control and reign in your body instead of obeying these sinful desires. And then the next verse, which is a little bit like a long run-on sentence, let me give you the the Bob Lee translation. You can just keep it short, BLT translation. He says, stop being stupid. So if I had to summarize all this, stop being stupid. Now keep that BLT translation in mind as we look at the actual translation here. That's not a translation, that's a paraphrase, by the way. (laughs) He says this, in the light of all that, he gives an example. He says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. I highlighted offer because offer means, again, that you have the choice to do this, that this is not like God forcing you to do this. He he loves us too much. He doesn't force us to do anything, but it's us choosing now to offer ourselves to God instead of offering ourselves to sin. Again, we've been freed to choose. That's the good news that before you and I did not have a choice. We were enslaved to sin. But now we've been freed, and we can choose now to offer ourselves again to our old, sinful, broken, messy habits, which leads to death, destruction, and much regret and failure. We're now, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, His grace at work in us, we can now offer ourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. Now that word, I know, a churchy word for some of us, again, uh, it means basically doing the right thing. How many times have you have deep regrets when you did the right thing, did things God's way? I mean, it can happen sometimes, but typically when we do things God's way, the right way, which is what righteousness is, it leads to a life of, again, fulfillment and hope and joy, not regret. Again, when you look back on your worst regrets, the things that, again, those failures, oftentimes it's because, again, we were just, again, offering ourselves to our sinful nature, doing what feels good. You do you. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? YOLO, you only live once, right? Go out and be crazy. Sleep, as, sleep with as many people as you want. Spend money, just irresponsible. You do whatever you want. I mean, that's what the world says, right? And because of that, you and I have regrets. And then Paul says this, the good news. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin is no longer your master. That this old nature that, again, controlled you in the past, led to a road of, again, failures and all these regrets and things you wish you could do all over, he's no longer your master anymore. Who's your master? Jesus. He is not only your savior, but he is your Lord, again, is what he's saying. And he's saying now, because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Let me pause here for a moment. When he's talking about the law, he's not talking about the laws of our country, state, world. He's talking about the Old Covenant, that if you read the Old Testament, there was a certain way that the people of God related to God and how they could live in a way to please him. And basically, it was based on their performance. And and again, they had to, when they fell short of that performance, offer animal sacrifices just again to be with God. But the New Covenant, which is now under grace, is based on Jesus' payment on our behalf, not our performance. And because of that, when under the law, there was really no room for failure. You had to be perfect. But under the new covenant, under grace now, we had a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And grace means now, you know what? We have room to fail and we have room to grow. And so he's saying, you know what? You're no longer under this old system. And this new covenant, the covenant that you and I have in this room with our Lord, it's far better because there's grace and there's mercy and there's things that we don't deserve. There is room for failure and room for growth. I like this comment from this commentary. It says, being under grace and under the mastery of Christ allows us the freedom not to sin. Let me read this one more time. Being under grace and under the mastery of Christ allows us the freedom not to sin. Initially, that may not sound like such a great freedom, right? (laughs) Maybe you want some other type of freedom to do whatever you want. But in fact, I think for those of us who are honest with ourselves, this is amazing. This is why it's called the good news. 
Because I don't know how many times I've done things, said things, you know, made decisions that I regret deeply. I wish I could have done something different. And that's what it means now to be under grace, that we have the freedom, the power by God's spirit in us to not to sin anymore, not to fail. And when we do fail, to grow through it. And then Paul sort of shifts gear here, gears here. He says, for trying to, he's addressing a, a, a question or an issue that's happening or some objection that someone may have to the fact that we're now under grace and not under the law. Paul says this, what then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, by no, by no means. The BLT translation, heck no. <laughs> He's saying, heck no. What, what is he trying to say here? It's because some people now may sort of misconstrue or misapply what it means to live by grace. That, oh, we're not under the law anymore. We don't have to keep all these rules and regulations, which is true. But some people may use it as a license to do whatever they want and get away with it because, you know what? God will forgive me. I mean, just take a moment, let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. Have you ever been there, or when's the last time that you thought to yourself, wow, this sin is really attractive. He or she is really attractive. This thing is really attractive, right? And, and I know what the right thing is, but you know, it's, it's, it's really tugging at me. Maybe just this one time. Why? Because oh, I'm forgiven. And God will forgive me anyway. I just need to do my quiet time for a week, go to church, you know, do that service opportunity, volunteer in youth group, and I'll be okay with God. To which Paul would say, you don't understand what it means to live by grace. Grace is not a license to do whatever we want. Grace is an opportunity for us to live in a way that God designed for us to live, in a way that pleased him, without constantly failing and messing up and feeling shame and guilt and regret. You and I have been freed now to choose to live God's way. And that's what Paul is saying, by no means. And then he again, he presents his argument, why? He doesn't just say it, he also has something to back it up. Again, a long sentence here, so bear with me here. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? So throughout the book of Romans, he talks a lot about slaves and slavery, and to which today, not only do we find that offensive, it's somewhat distant, right? We find it offensive because slavery dehumanizes people who are made in the image of God. And for many of us, I think our contact with that, unless we're involved with uh, fighting against modern day slavery, sex trafficking, or something of that nature, we're not that familiar with. Uh, but we understand this, and again, because of slave trade and other issues, it's something, again, a word that's it's not something we would use very often. But in this day and culture, this was a term that, again, everyone was familiar with. It was just an everyday example. It wasn't offensive. Uh, it was almost neutral. The reason being, historians say that up to one-third of the Roman Empire were slaves at this time. One-third. Think about this. One out of three people that you would encounter at church, in the marketplace, wherever, was a slave. And they weren't slaves because of their ethnicity or because of racism or their skin color. They were slaves mostly because of socioeconomic reasons. You were poor, so you sold yourself into slavery to help back, pay back your debt or to earn money. Or your country was defeated in a war, so you were forcefully enslaved in some cases as well. So one-third, up to one-third of the Roman Empire were slaves. And so they all understood this concept. They also understood this concept that you know who your master is by who you obey. Someone calls your name, someone tells you to do it, that person runs and does it, goes to that person, that's that person's master. And so Paul is saying that what you obey or who you obey reveals who your master is. And before you met Christ, your master was sin. You didn't have the freedom to choose to obey or disobey. But now, because of Christ, you can be a slave to sin, again, which leads to death and, and regret and failure, which they were all familiar with, or you can be a slave to obedience which leads to righteousness, meaning obey God's commands. You see, again, there's a choice now. They've been free to choose. He's saying, think about this. When you lived the way you used to live, when you dated that type of people, when you used to go to those places, when you used to drink this, smoke this, do that with that person, what was the end result of all of that? Wasn't it death? Maybe you didn't die physically, but emotionally, mentally, internally, you were dying every day on the inside. So much regret. So much failure, right? So much shame and brokenness. He's saying, do you really want to go there again now as a follower of Jesus Christ? And just because, again, you think grace is a license to do everything? Or he's saying, you're free to choose now. 
you can choose to obey what God has for you, his plans. Because God, again, loves you, loves you so much. How do you know he loves you? Well, you just look at the cross. The fact that he gave his very one and only son to die for our sins. That's how much he loves us. You and I deserved eternal separation from God in a very real place called hell for eternity. Because he loves us, he put all of that punishment upon his son, his one and only beloved son. And that's why we can choose to obey him. We can trust him. And yes, sometimes what he calls us to obey, it's tough. It's not easy. To be honest, sin is so much more attractive. But he says, you know, when you choose that, it leads to righteousness, a right life, living in the right way. A life not full of regrets, but full of joy and hope and fulfillment. Again, he's talking to Christians here. Before you and I met Christ, this death would mean eternal death, separation from God. But he's talking to Christians who are already saved. They're going to heaven. But he's talking about the choices we make in the here and now as people who've been freed to choose. I like this, again, comment from the NIV Life Application Commentary. Any attitude that welcomes rationalizes or excuses sin, it's not grace, but slavery to sin. One more time. Any attitude that welcomes, rationalizes, or excuses sin, it's not grace. It's not living by grace, but slavery to sin itself. You're back under the law. You put yourself under the law, he's saying. And the law does not lead, again, to life, but to death. It points out how messy and broken you are, and there's no hope there. He's saying again, How do you live by grace? And then Paul again shares the good news again, encourages them. After the bad news, after the stick, now he comes with the hope here and encourages them. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. It's like, thank God though. Thank God for his grace because you used to be this way. Before you met Christ, we all used to be slaves to sin, which led to death and failure and regrets. He's saying we all used to be that way. But now, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we've come to obey from our, your heart, our hearts. It means wholeheartedly. Maybe before you met Christ and you grew up in the church, and maybe, you, again, you sort of had an outward perspective of what God was like and what heaven and hell was like, and maybe you tried to obey God in your own strength because you're just scared. You're scared of God, scared of going to hell, scared of an angry God, whatever that is. He says, now, you're not obeying for that reason. You're obeying wholeheartedly because you've experienced the grace, the love, the mercy of God. You've experienced his power working in you. That as you choose to follow him, that he continues to change you. That you're not the same man or woman you used to be. Which is a sign, again, that we really know Jesus. That he is in our life. Because, again, he is constantly at work changing us. And he says, we obey this pattern of teaching. Meaning how to live in a way that pleases God. Which God's commands, God's word. He tells us how to live. And now we obey, not because we have to, but because we want to. And we have, it's now claimed our allegiance. That this is who we follow now. And then finally, the last verse we're going to look at today, it says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. This is the good news. He's saying now we've been freed to choose, to choose again, to do the right thing and live a life again where we learn from our failures and we try not to repeat those same failures. Or you can still choose to, again, walk in your old ways. And I feel like that's a choice he gives us every moment, every day, and we come together like this. Because let's be honest, sin is attractive. And let's also be honest, you are forgiven. You do know Jesus. And let's be honest again, you know, when we make wrong choices, there is grace and forgiveness. But at the same time, you're you're living a life that is again subpar, full of regrets, full of failures, full of mistakes. When instead we can be growing through them and moving forward. That we're not stuck in the past. That we can move forward into the life the Lord has for us, not just our lives, but our marriages, our kids, our careers, our finances, our church, that we can grow through these mistakes and move forward. Someone said this, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. I mean, it sounds like a pretty mediocre, subpar sports career. Anyone know who said this? Yeah, I think all the 
sports fan here know who said this. A not-so-famous guy named Michael Jordan, probably one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Here is someone who has learned to fail forward, who's in the midst of his mistakes and failures learned to grow through them. Let me ask you a question. How much more so for us who are followers of Jesus Christ, who have the spirit of the living God in us, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us? How much more so can we learn and grow and succeed as we move beyond our past fa failure, shame, and brokenness? And the key is, as Paul would remind us, I think, today, is to see every failure from a perspective as an opportunity to learn by grace and with God's help to learn and grow so that we don't keep repeating those same mistakes again and again. Let me ask you a question. What is that regret, that mistake, maybe recently that you're wrestling with? And let me ask you another question for you just to think about, not to beat you or shame you up or anything like that. Have you learned anything from it? Or will you continue to make the same mistake in the relationship, in your finances, in your career, in your faith? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, would you just take some time, take that before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to humble myself before you today. I want to choose because you freed me. I want to choose to obey, but I can't seem to obey. I can't seem to break this addiction, this habit, this depression, this low self-esteem, whatever you're wrestling with. I can't seem to break it, God. I can't seem to forgive myself. I can't seem to forgive others, but I want to learn and I want to grow and I want to move forward just as you said I could. So God, help me. The Bible says when we humble ourselves before God, he lifts us up in due time. So I ask you, if that's you, you don't have to if you don't want to. We don't make anyone do this or do anything here. But if you're struggling with any of these failures, and again, it's haunting you and you can't move forward and you're always looking backward, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, would you just take some time and say, God, help me where I'm at. And throughout the next couple of weeks as we talk about moving forward, failing forward, would you ask God again continually to help you and that help may come in the form of a Christian counselor, a good brother or sister in an accountability setting. It may come again from a pastor. It may come, above all else, the Holy Spirit using all those things to help us move forward. Because then the promise is that we will grow and we will learn as we move forward. As I ask the praise him to come back up, for others of us who are here, and uh, maybe you're not wrestling with that today, it's only been an East week since Easter. Would you just thank God? Would you thank God for his great love? Would you thank God for the cross and the empty tomb? Would you thank God for his great love? Would you thank God again for the ways that you're not the same man or woman you used to be? Would you thank God that he is not done with you yet, that he's still working in you? Would you lift up the different things that you're wrestling with to a God who is constantly at work in us if we let him? The thing that I, I love about God is that he does not kick down the door of our hearts. He sees you in pain, he sees us suffering and struggling, but he doesn't kick down the door and force his way in. He waits for us to choose, to open the door of our hearts and let him in. How do I know that? Revelation chapter 3, 20, Jesus said, here I am, I stand in the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come and eat with him and he with me. Sometimes we feel like because of our failures, because of our shame, because of our brokenness, that again, that God is just wants to get into our, kick down the door and just again yell at us, right? He's angry at us. Jesus said, uh-uh. Well, no, that's not it. I'm coming in. I want to hang out with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to love on you. I want to help you. Let's take some time. Let's invite him to come in in the midst of our failures so that we can learn and we can move forward in this season. Let's pray together. Amen. Thank you, AV and praise team, for leading us into worship today. Yeah, I'm grateful for all of you guys too, every week. Um, please come back next week. We'll continue in our current message series as we build upon what we talked about today. Uh, just wanted to share with you just a couple of optional discussion questions for self-reflection, for family devotions, for your small group time if you want to use them. How do you interpret failure? What does that mean to you? What does that look like? Second, what does it mean to fail forward? To learn and grow from our mistakes and failures. Third, how do we stay honest about our propensity to sin without excusing sin in our lives? The tension between the law and grace. Please allow me to pray for us before we go our separate ways. Let's pray together.
Jesus, we fall down before you in awe with so much gratitude, Lord, with thankfulness, Lord God, for all that you've done on our behalf. We thank you, Jesus, that while we were still sinners, your enemies, you chose, you willingly died for us. And that's why we fall down before you. We lay our crowns, our successes, all the good things in this life, Lord, they all come from you. And so we lay them down once again, Lord. We also lay down, Lord, just our tendency to try to control our lives, to try to plan out everything, to try to do everything in our own strength, including overcoming weaknesses and addictions and brokenness in our lives. And we keep coming back to that place of regret, Lord, wishing we had done something different. But I thank you that the good news is that you're not done with us yet that your spirit in us is at work, whether we realize it or not, that we are making progress moment by moment. And I ask, Lord, throughout the next few weeks as we talk about this topic of failing forward, that you would meet us in intimate, powerful, personal ways, each and every one of us, wherever we're at. And would you help us to move forward, to fail forward, to grow and learn, and not to keep repeating the same mistakes, Lord. I pray, Lord, we'd also renew, Lord, again, um, submitting to your leadership in our lives you are the only king. You are the only master. And I pray, Lord God, that we would obey, not because, again, we have to or you demand it, because we know that's because you love us and you want the best for us, Lord. So lift up everyone to you here in person and those watching online. Help us to re-experience, Lord, the joy of our salvation, our first love, as we spend time with you this week and the weeks to come. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today in person and online. Hope you have a wonderful week and we will see you next week.